Um, this is actually the uh, first lecture in the, in the Keywords um, public lecture series um, for 2012. Um, and uh, you know, we're, we're really, um, we're really uh, kicking it off uh, with a, a very uh, you know, eminent speaker and a, a, a fascinating um, topic, which I think exceeds its kind of literary historical parameters in, in many ways, given, given what a, given what a, a, a generalised uh, uh, adjective it means to be romantic these days um, in, in Gillian Russell. Um, but I'll just give a, a, a really quick um, um, heads up as to what the, uh, as to what the schedule um, is uh, this year. Um, next month, we've, we've got someone, I, I dare say, um, uh, equally eminent in, in Hilary Charlesworth giving a, a lecture on international law, um, um, a heavily um, yeah, contested term that's certainly in need of, of historicising. Um, so obviously that will sum up some of Hilary's uh, interests over many years. And we've, then, we've then got Frank von Schorner, who's a relatively recent appointment to the history program at the ANU, talking about sexuality um, on July 30th. Um, now, Frank has just completed a book on the history of sort of sexuality and the representations of sexuality in Australia, so it's a great chance to sort of hear more about his work. I've taken a little bit of convener's prerogative in, in, in uh, deciding to give a talk on, um, on character myself in, in September, um, so, uh, which, which is a term which in sort of literary and, and philosophy is, is sort of having a bit of rejuvenation, um, so, so I think, I think worth, uh, worth looking at. Again, a term that, that, that very much goes back to, uh, to the 18th uh, century. Um, and again, a, a, a relatively recent appointment, Shemin Black from our English program will be talking about humanitarianism uh, in October. And we finish with Shino Kanishi, who's in the history program talking about encounters, uh, you know, particularly looking at some, some first contact, uh, Australian sort of, sort of first contact uh, narratives and so on. But, but the whole, there's a lot of theory around cultural encounters, particularly in, in in you know, colonial situations and their significance and their legacy. So I think we've got a really, you know, even if I do say this to myself, I think we've got a, a really interesting um, program that's this year. Um, for anyone who doesn't regularly receive, obviously, updates about the program, about the Keywords uh, program, you can go to the website for the School of Cultural Inquiry, which has the full program. They're, they're always in here on Mondays, 5 through 6.30 p.m. Um, so we try to generate as little uh, confusion as, as possible in that respect. Now, I don't want to waste too much more of our um, time. Um, uh, it, it gives me great pleasure uh, to introduce um, uh, you know, a colleague of mine, um, Professor Gillian Russell, who is an Australian Research Council Professorial Fellow in the School of Cultural Inquiry, right here. Um, and she, her, her ARC project is a history of the theatre in late Georgian Britain, space, spaces, sociability and cultural networks, which gives a little bit of a guide to some, some ongoing, um, you know, thematic interests of, of, uh, of Gillian. Um, um, I'm not, she really does have a huge resume, which you can check under the researchers page, so I'm just going to give her a, a really quick little highlights pack, pass, uh, package with a sense of some of Gillian's thematic concerns. Um, a really important, uh, and a lot of these have actually also been edited volumes, which have really been a significant sort of scholarly breakthrough. So Gillian was one of the uh, editors on the 1999 uh, An Oxford Companion to the Romantic Age, uh, British Culture, 1776 through 1832, uh, which was out through Oxford University Press. And this, this itself was a, a really, um, helped a lot, along with a lot of work that had been going on through the 80s and 90s, but really helped to uh, reposition romantic studies much more in cultural, um, historical terms. And it was also a really interesting volume because it, 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 was, it had an kind of anti antipodean you know, sort of perspective uh, on, uh, on romanticism. And was also very much interested in the links between romanticism and that kind of radical cultural politics of the 1790s. Um, uh, if, we, if we fast forward a little bit, um, Gillian is an editor of a really important volume. She's also a contributor to this volume called Romantic Sociability, Social Networks and Literary Culture in Britain, 1770 through 1840. And she's a co-editor along with Clara Chewitt. Um, this, particularly the introduction to this volume, Introducing Romantic Sociability, is, is, is a very important um, scholarly text in that it decisively rejects um, 
a, a sort of preconceived and sort of self-legitimising in a sense notion we have of, of, of romantic solitude. Uh, the isolated poet, poet who's expressing their authentic self, that's, that, that sort of image is somewhat influenced by people like Rousseau. And what Clara Stewart and, and Gillian do is talk, talk much more about a kind of Habermasian um, idea of, of, of the public sphere um, and how the romantic period was ac actually still very much uh, maintained a sort of conversational ideal. But uh, at the same time, Gillian and, and Clara Stewart and the rest of the contributors to that volume were very eminent themselves, really give a much more discriminating and, and sort of historically complex sense of that Habermasian ideal of the, of the public sphere, which is, which is often coded male in, in various ways. And it's certainly well worth reading Gillian's contribution to the sociability of romantic lecturing in that volume, which is about colleges, lectures and, and so on. Um, uh, Gillian's also a major Jane Austen uh, scholar. She's, mm. she's got multiple contributions to the, uh, to the Cambridge UP uh, companion to Jane Austen, particularly uh, her, her entry on sociability. Uh, and she's done a lot of work on, um, um, the con uh, on, on Georgian, on Georgian theatre um, um, as well. Um, as, as well as theatres of war so in, in the Napoleonic era and their representations in, in a range of, of, uh, of novelists and so on. Um, but, but Julian is very diverse in her interests and we really have her to thank for, for a much more extensive knowledge of Australia's sort of early colonial history of, in, in some respects. Um, uh, I was actually fortunate to be at her National Library of Australia lecture in 2008, very, not long after the discovery of Australia's um, earliest colonial uh, playbill, uh, which is sorry, which is sorry, Australia's earliest printed document. I believe it's 1796. Is, is that right? And that's a, a playbill for for Jane Shaw. Um, uh, as a piece of ephemera, the playbill um, offers tantalising glimpses of the social and cultural life of the early colony. And what's come out of all of Gillian's research in collaboration with the National Library is a really, really interesting um, book called The Playbill, which I think is just out, or out in the last couple of months through the National Library of Australia, which tries to understand, I mean, it's an extraordinary early moment in, you know, with a barely surviving colony to already be having a a kind of uh, thriving theatrical life. So Gillian's kind of delving into exactly why that, that was and answering a lot of questions about, about the playbill. And that's kind of typical of Gillian's work, which is taking certain details, certain aspects of material culture, and, and really trying to understand the kind of cultural networks behind them. So without any further ado, I'll, I'll introduce, uh, sorry, I'll introduce Gillian to talk about this very important and interesting topic of romanticism. Thanks, sorry. Ned. <laughs> That was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, can I hire you? <laughs> yes, I am. Of course. Yeah. Okay. Um, should I? I'm not sure if I'll stand. I might sit and I'll, I might stand up at some stage. But um, when he recently announced his, his intention to withdraw from the Republican primary contest, Newt Gingrich declared his commitment to a romantic vision of America. On Googling the words romantic and Gingrich, I discovered that he has a long history of self-identification as a romantic, going back to the early 1990s when he challenged budget cuts to the space program on the grounds that he was a, quote, romantic utopian idealist. <laughs> when in January of this year he argued for a colony on the moon, a speech for which he was widely ridiculed, <laughs> he also defended his pro proposal as a romantic idea. Mm. One journalist claimed that far from being exceptional, Gingrich's romanticism pointed, quote, to the essential newt, simultaneously <laughs> sublime and ridiculous. <laughs> the Gingrich example highlights the enduring potency as well as the slippery complexity of the key word romanticism and the related adjective romantic. As a professed student of history, Gingrich was trying to harness the idealism of 19th century transcendentalism and ultimately the myths of the founding fathers in the service of his brand of politics. For many commentators though, the sense of history was lost in the pejorative connotations of the romantic as a foolish and consequential dreamer. The ridiculous trump the sublime. The Gingrich example illustrates the significance of romanticism as a cultural movement, the potency of which can still be invoked in 2012. However, the failure of Gingrich's attempt to re-energise the heroic ideal of American free enterprise suggests that, like a signal from a dying planet, and perhaps the American dream itself, romanticism's communicative power may be becoming exhausted. In this lecture, I want to explore this theme in relation to the history and current state of British romanticism as a subfield of the academic discipline of English literature.
acknowledging, however, that Romanticism is capable of meaning much more than this. That's part of its conceptual difficulty. It embraces aesthetics, mm -hmm. philosophy, history, ideology, uh, punk music even, and his historical, uh, historically foundational for most of the societies of the Western world. There are many, many romanticisms, but only 50 minutes or so in this lecture. So what I'm focusing on is the British case for its paradigmatic significance. I'm also approaching this case in terms of the history of how romanticism has evolved as a subset of English literature, with some speculative considerations about whether or not the discipline has a future. In relation to the latter question, whether the study of romantic literature has a future, the leading US romanticist James <coughs> Chandler is not so sure. He's editor of the Cambridge History of English Romantic Literature, published by CUP in 2009. The previous uh, volume in the series is entitled The Cambridge History of English Literature, 1660-1780. So its successor stands out both for its lack of chronological boundaries and for its emphasis on the term romantic, suggesting that there was something radically and qualitatively different about literary history after 1780. The foregrounding of romantic is, however, beset with some anxiety. Apart from concluding with an essay by Jerome McGann entitled Is Romanticism Finished? The volume is notable for the last paragraph of Chandler's introduction in which he states, this is a, a longish quote, I quote, it is a matter of, ex of, of extreme uncertainty what we might expect of a Cambridge history of English literature a century hence. It's possible, with the speed of English language use around the world, that even more of its contributors might come from an even greater number of places abroad. Then again, it is also possible, if English literary history is not nourished outside Britain, that many fewer contributors will come from abroad. There is, of course, no assurance that such a history will actually be undertaken again in a century's time, nor if it is that it will appear in books like this one. End of quote. The context for Chandler's concern, outlined in the paragraph that immediately precedes this one, is declining support for the humanities in the US, undermining the position of the US as a world leader in British studies, and the diversification of English into fields such as gender, cultural, and film and media studies, competing for the space and authority previously occupied by British and Romantic literature in particular. Chandler's questioning of the long-term viability of books like this one as a medium for scholarship can also be said to reflect uncertainty over the future of academic publishing. The sense here of the imminence of cultural change, the magnitude and consequences of which cannot be properly discerned, is characteristically romantic, making Chandler's introduction itself a kind of romantic text. A famous precedent is William Wordsworth's preface to the Lyrical Ballads, which is characterised by the same profound sense of defamiliarisation, of the ground shifting below one. In it, Wordsworth wrote, I quote, A multitude of causes unknown to former times are now acting with a combined force to blunt the discriminating powers of the mind, and unfitting it for all voluntary exertion to reduce it to a state of almost savage torpor. The most effective of these causes are the great national events which are daily taking place and the increasing accumulation of men in cities, where the uniformity of their occupations produces a craving for extraordinary incident which the rapid communication of intelligence hourly gratifies. This passage is characteristically romantic in its acute consciousness of history. The sense that the 1790s represented some kind of radical break with the past and also the sense that time itself had speeded up, producing a collect collective stupefaction, a savage torpor. Partly these changes were the result of events such as the French Revolution, but they were also, Wordsworth suggests, the effect of a revolution in print media. The rapid communication of news via the press which one could hourly refresh. Then as now, Romanticism takes shape around the condition of media shift. Mm. 
In Chandler's case, the uncertain status and long-term viability of the book. In Wordsworth's 1790s, the transformative potential of daily penetrating information. The historicizing self-consciousness of romanticists and the theatricality of how they stage themselves in relation to their historical moment are therefore deeply ingrained. But in the last three years, this tendency has taken a particularly anxious turn. This development relates to the great national events of 9-11 and the GFC, as well as academia's own increasingly fraught battlegrounds, of which we heard the noise of today, the crisis of the public university, to which the leading uh, interdisciplinary humanities journal representation has devoted a special issue late last year, and which we're currently experiencing as an intensification of managerialism in a number of Australian universities. Incidentally, it's noteworthy how journals such as Representations and Critical Inquiry are addressing these issues, hitherto the preserve of more journalistic and profession-oriented academic forums. In the US in 2011, campus activism in relation to the higher education crisis coalesced with the politics and practices of the Occupy movement. The um, image that I used on the um, mm. poster for this talk shows students and staff demonstrating at UC Berkeley in November last year. Calling themselves Occupy Cal, they were protesting against increases in tuition fees for students and staffing cuts at, at Berkeley as part of its operational excellence plan. The placard at the front, uh, which has on it, Who's Afraid for Virginia Woolf, mm. was made by the English professor Celeste Langan, who became involved in a confrontation with the UC Berkeley police. She was grabbed by the hair and pulled to the ground and was later charged with resisting arrest and remaining at the scene of a riot. Her case is still in the US courts. Langan is a notable romanticist, best known for her 1995 book, Romantic Vagrancy, Wordsworth and the Simulation of Freedom, a theoretically sophisticated study of the constitutive importance of the vagrant mendicant to romantic ideas of subjectivity and the social. Obviously, who's afraid for William Wordsworth wouldn't have had the same impact, <laughs> but Langan's background as a romanticist underpins her defense of Virginia Woolf and a liberal humanist education, much in the same way as it entitles Chandler in the Cambridge history to address the future of English literary history as a whole. Such claims aren't simply aggrandizing. They reflect the importance of the late 18th and early 19th centuries as the period when English literature acquires fully fledged authority and social power, entitling Romanticism as a subfield to speak for the discipline as a whole. Nor is the idealism of Langan's actions on November 9th last year, her willingness to put her body on the line for the sake of Virginia Woolf, necessarily incompatible with how her book, Romantic Vagrancy, details the historical and philosophical origins of claiming imaginative literature as a badge of freedom. The particular quality of some, some contemporary uh, romanticists is how, in the wake of deconstruction and the historical turn, they're capable of seeing through romanticism, but yet keep being compelled to rehearse and enact its dreams. I will return ultimately to the state of romanticism in 2012, but I now want to take some time to sketch an outline of what romanticism might be. No easy task, as it's one of the most debated and fraught terms in literary studies. Nor is the contestation over the, over the meaning of romanticism a recent phenomenon, as you might think. In his seminal article on the discrimination of romanticisms from 1924, A.O. Lovejoy begins by noting that 100 years before, two Frenchmen, Dupuy and Cottenay, had experienced 12 years of suffering in trying to define romanticism. <laughs> <laughs> Typical man uh, manifestations of romanticism, according to Lovejoy, I quote, have been variously conceived to be a passion for moonlight, 
for red waistcoats, oh. for Gothic churches, for futurist paintings, for talking exclusively about oneself, <laughs> for, for hero worship, for losing oneself in an ecstatic contemplation of nature. And as you see, I didn't actually bring my red waistcoat today. <laughs> um, James Chandler draws attention to the two dimensions of the ism in Romanticism. The idea of a, doct a doctrinal position on the lines of ancient philosophies, such as Stoicism and, Epi and Epicureanism, and the more modern sense of an ideological movement, something that wants to change society and lives, mm. yeah. such as Marxism, feminism, or economic rationalism. Mm. Arguably, therefore, the Romantic movement is the first ism, and later isms would have been impossible without it. It's, a, it's this very ismness which makes Romanticism so difficult to pin down and define. It has the potential to cross many spheres and fields of endeavour mm. and to cast them in its own penetrating atmosphere. The idea of cultures and times having an atmosphere of, and, or climate and of there being the possibility of change in the climate of culture is an invention of this period, as Tom Ford's showing us. The complexity of the term romantic, its shifting indeterminacy across time, is the focus of the relevant entry on romantic in Raymond Williams' key words. Romantic, as Williams indicates, had its origins in the tradition of medieval and early modern prose narr um, narratives in prose and verse called romances, which dealt with exotic tales of love and adventure. By the late 18th century, romantic was being used to describe the extravagant, the picturesque, or the quaintly affecting. In Persuasion, for example, Jane Austen refers to the romantic rocks of the coast around Lyme Regis. The application of romantic to the idea of a cultural movement, its transmutation into an ism, only begins to occur in the early 19th century and has its origins on the continent, particularly in Germany. Romantic in the specific sense of a romantic literary movement with different national configurations dates from the late 19th century, whereas Romanticism, as a branch of literary study in the academy, a constitutive field of the discipline of English literature, is an invention of the 20th century. The relationship of literary Romanticism to other Romanticisms in philosophy, the visual arts, music, theatre and so on is something I can only gesture to in this talk. It would probably take 12 years of suffering to detail. <laughs> <laughs> Romanticism's status as an ism has meant that it has been a priori and interdisciplinary or even an indisciplinary phenomenon. Mm. Its rhizomatic ubiquity can be seen in the cognate entries at the end of Williams's keyword entry on romantic. He asks us to quote, see creative, fiction, folk, generation, myth, novel, original, sex, subjective. Romanticism as a branch of the study of English literature reached its ascendancy in the period after World War II, particularly in the US where romantic studies played a leading role in enhancing the cultural capital of both England and post-war academia. By 1960, when the journal Studies in Romanticism was founded, Romanticism was firmly identified with a particular genre, poetry, and with the super canon of male poets, what's mm. often described as the big six of Wordsworth, Coleridge, Blake, Byron, Shelley, and Keats. Mm. In the 1970s, this canon was in a way narrowed to the work of just one man, Wordsworth. The post-war period between 1945 and 1970 is when Romanticists were most assured and confident about their object of study. René Wellick, for example, described the Romantic creed as the, quote, implication of imagination, symbol, myth, and organic nature, part of the great endeavour to overcome the split between subject and object. It is a closely coherent body of thought and feeling. Thought and feeling, that's the, the emphasis here. This confidence also found expression in monumental editing projects such as the Cornell Wordsworth and the Princeton Coleridge, which not only enhanced the prestige of these writers, but also that of the institutions sponsoring these editions. Mm. 
Many of the enduring ideas and popular perceptions of romantic writers were cemented in the post-war period, such as the idea of poetry and indeed po uh, romantic poetry and indeed poetry in general as primarily the expression of feeling. Mm -hmm. Post-war romanticism also consolidated the view of the writer as a solitary creative genius dwelling in his imagination and using that imagination to address the meaning of truth, knowledge and selfhood and to talk with both the past and the future, a model of inquiry that was also extended to the practice of literary criticism. The imaginative faculty was what set the poet apart from other writers, enabling him to transcend the vicissitudes of history and distingu distinguishing poetry from other forms of literature and writing in general as the preeminent mode of literary expression. As commentators have noted, the romantic scholarship of this period had its own romantic idealism, the heroic individualism of a Wordsworth or a Coleridge being a model for the self-fashioning of the male academic in the post-war US, a response to what were intensely politicised times, mm -hmm. comparable to the 1790s or post-1815. What Jerome McGann later characterised as, quote, the grand illusion of every romantic poet, the idea that poetry or even consciousness can set one free of the ruins of history and culture, also applied to those who were studying and teaching Romanticism in this period. Romanticism's preeminence was reconfigured but not fundamentally challenged by the rise of deconstruction in the 1980s. Work on Wordsworth was one of the main conduits by which theory entered the US English department in this period. A greater threat to the coherence of the mid-century version of Romanticism came from the more historical and materialist emphases of the late 80s and 90s, notably new historicism and feminism, influenced by British cultural studies that had been pioneered by Raymond Williams, and Marxist influenced histories such as A.P. Thompson's The Making of the English Working Class. Thompson being a profoundly romantic historian, as well as a historian of literary romanticism, particularly Blake. In 1981, Marilyn Butler published Romantics, Rebels and Reactionaries, English Literature and Its Background, 1760 to 1830, a survey aimed at the general reader and students in which she challenged what she called, quote, the cult of the romantic writer by emphasizing literary production as also, quote, a collective activity. Authors are not the solitaries of the romantic myth, Butler claimed, but citizens. Mm. The interrogation of the mid-century myths of Romanticism by more materialist approaches was apparent in the 1980s and 90s in book titles such as Questioning Romanticism, Beyond Romanticism, Revisioning Romanticism, and by the yoking of Romanticism as a category to other emergent isms such as post-colonialism and feminism, the big six being a dream target for feminist critique. The category of English Romantic literature also underwent a form of devolution, as Ireland, Wales and Scotland were recognised as centres of separate, distinctive Romantic traditions. Robert Burns, who until the early 20th century was prominent in the canon of Romantic poets and then disappeared, has experienced a critical revival in the last few years, with major biographies and critical studies. It could be argued that the centre of romantic studies in the UK today is not the axis of Oxford, Cambridge and London, but that of Edinburgh and Glasgow. In addition, poetry has, to, has been to some extent decentered as the romantic genre. The prose fiction of the period, particularly the work of women writers such as Charlotte Smith, Mary Hayes, <coughs> Lady Morgan and Mariah Edgeworth is receiving more attention. It's still remarkable, however, that the first study to explicitly link Jane Austen with the category of Romanticism was Clara Chute's Romantic Austen, published just 10 years ago in 2002. As a result of the historical or cultural turn since the 1980s, there's been a certain distancing or dissociation from the mythic, transcendental and transhistorical connotations of Romanticism which with the formulation romantic studies 
or romantic period studies emerging as alternatives. Romantic period as a label came to the fore in the mid-1990s with the publication of Jerome McGann's New Oxford book of romantic period verse. The innovation of that volume was its organisation of po poems by year of publication rather than by author, thereby de-emphasising and recontextualising <coughs> the work of the big six. Mm. How one defines oneself within this particular subfield of English literature has now become quite com complicated. I noted that when she gave a recent seminar in the <coughs> HRC, Clara Chute described herself as working on romantic literature and cultural history while John May at the University of Warwick had until recently the awkward hybrid title of Professor of Romanticism Studies. That title has been changed to the perhaps equally inelegant one of Professor of 18th and 19th century literature and print culture. Oh. <laughs> As an alternative to Romanticism, Romantic period studies has its own drawback, drawbacks because of the difficulty of defining when that period begins and ends. The Romantic Age is often framed by key political events, with the French Revolution of 1789 as the beginning and the Fre Reform Act of 1832 marking the transition to the Victorian era. Some studies, such as Ian McCallum's Oxford Companion, choose to begin with the American Declaration of Independence in 1776. In Romantics, Rebels and Reactionaries, Marilyn Butler moves her start date back to 1760, but avoids categorising the period 1760 to 89 as pre-Romanticism, as some critics have done. All of these dates are basically arbitrary, however. Mm. Not only is it uncertain when the Romantic period pr precisely began, yeah. it's also unclear whether it or not it's actually ended as the concluding essay in the Cambridge history, Is Romanticism Finished?, suggests. Butler herself made the claim that, quote, Romanticism is incohate because it is not a single intellectual movement, but a complex of responses to certain conditions that Western society has experienced and continues to experience since the middle of the 18th century. In other words, we are still in the Romantic period. Conversely, why begin with 1776 or 1760? Could the Romantic period be said to have started with the print culture revolution of the English Civil Wars of the 17th century, or even with the invention of print itself? As an alternative categorization, the Romantic period is thus as problematic in some ways as Romanticism. Late Georgian also isn't much better because it tends to allow the magnitude and scope of cultural change after 1760. The fact that something different, may, though maybe we don't know the precise date when it started, did happen. I referred previously to the cognates of the term romantic in Raymond Williams's keywords. Many of the other keywords in that book, such as class, criticism, country, culture, genius, organic, originality, popular, representative and revolution either have their origins in or are given new definitive meanings in the late 18th and early 19th centuries. Another key word not in the Williams book would be conservative, modern understandings of which are acknowledged by John Hard and George W. Bush to have their origins in Edmund Burke's reflections on the revolution in France from 1790 a book which invented the idea and practice of the politics of a war of cultures. Indeed, Williams's key words book could be described as a romantic project in its own right. It conveys an acute sense of the urgency of, of addressing an imminent present in relation to a past that's equally tangible. In his introduction, Williams described key words as coming out of a, quote, moment when his attempts to, quote, understand several urgent contemporary problems, problems quite literally of understanding my immediate world, achieved a particular shape in trying to understand a tradition, a critical dis stance not so dissimilar from Wordsworth's in the preface to the lyrical ballads. Romanticism is therefore embedded in questions of historiography, 
and ultimately the meaning of history itself, which periodization raises. It can't escape or transcend them. Romanticism invents and reifies the concepts of period and movement as a way of objectifying the historical moment, particularly the sense of the imminence of change, as well as simultaneously putting these very concepts into question. There are other more pragmatic difficulties with how periodization functions in romantic studies. If theoretically the romantic period is boundless, this is not the case in terms of what is researched and taught. Because of how academic specialization has developed in the last few years, and also because of the increasing need to assert and defend the institutional interests of the subfield. There have been some turf wars between Romantic and 18th century studies, with some Romanticists viewing uh, the encroachment of the long in the uh, long 18th century as leading to the loss of jobs and authority for Romantic studies. Thus, in spite of the questioning of the meaning of periodization in Romanticism, the traditional view of the period is still very powerful, with what I'd suggest are negative effects on how the incohate complexity of Romantic literary culture is understood. Continuing emphases on the 1790s on our first generation poets such as Wordsworth and Coleridge, and on the years 1812 to 1824 associated with the second generation figures such as Byron, Keats and Shelley, have led to the neglect of the significance of the 1820s and 30s. These decades represent a kind of black hole between Romanticism and Victorian studies. Similarly, in spite of Butler's starting date of 1760, the period between the ascension of George III and the French Revolution hasn't really received the attention it deserves. In terms of period as well as canon, Romanticism can be very narrow indeed. The more Romanticism changes then, the more it seems to stay the same. In spite of what Chandler calls the increasing suspicion of the category of Romanticism, the apparent opening up of the field to a range of theories and critical approaches, and also the Jeremiads of some scholars and commentators in the Murdoch press about the so-called triumph of cultural studies, the power of Romanticism as a literary brand is an enduring one. The Cambridge Studies in Romanticism series has recently reached its 217th volume. The comparable series on 18th century literature wound up a number of years ago. And the professional associations of the field, and I'm going to go into acronym, acronyms, acronymism, <laughs> another key word for us. Um, the professional associations, that's Nasser, the North American Association for the Study of Romanticism, BARS, British Association of Romantic Studies, and BARS is not an inappropriate acronym in that sense, <laughs> uh, which was set up in, in 1989, and our own recently established Romantic Studies Association of Australasia are all thriving. Nor could it be said that the big six are being ignored or that the term Romanticism has been eclipsed by Romantic period. Of the ten books most recently published in the Cambridge series, four featured Romanticism in their titles and eight devoted a major part of their attention to big six writers. Of the latter, three were single author studies with two on Blake and one on Shelley. The two exceptions, which could be said to represent an alternative, less canonical Romanticism, were books on prose fiction in Scotland and Ireland, respectively. This evidence would suggest that the authority of the Big Six as paradigmatic of Romanticism is as powerful as ever, and that far from crowding them out, women writers in particular remain marginal. This pattern is also reflected in the teaching of Romanticism. A survey undertaken by Sharon Rustin in the UK in 2006 discovered that Wordsworth, Coleridge, Blake, Byron, Shelley and Keats still dominated the undergraduate curriculum. Rustin's findings would be confirmed by the history of the teaching of Romantic literature here at the ANU, which apart from a period in the 1990s when John May and I taught a course on the paper wars of the 1790s has had a continuing emphasis on some major canonical writers. I want to stress that I'm not discounting the value of the big six writers. We continue to resort to them because of the complexity of their writing, 
and the magnitude of their cultural achievement. It's important that undergraduates have familiarity with them, though ideally I'd also like them to know about the existence of Maria Edgeworth, William Hazlitt, John Clare, Sarah Siddons, not to mention the richness of periodical writing. I'm pointing out firstly that from the vantage point of 2012, Romanticism hasn't changed as radically as we might think it has. And secondly, that Romanticism is remarkably adept at reinventing itself. The big six can be said to have colonised and outlasted theory rather than the other way around. Why then does the Cambridge his history ask, is Romanticism finished? The threat to Romanticism, I would suggest, relates to the, an increasing anxiety about the category of literature with which Romanticism is interimplicated. The meaning of literature undergoes a transformation in the Romantic period. Whereas at the beginning, let's say the 1770s, literary endeavour encompassed a wide range of writing, by the 1820s, the primacy of imaginative literature, hitherto a subset of the literary field, and the distinction of the author of such texts as artist or genius, a legitimate member of the professional classes, was, uh, had been, uh, become well established. The consolidation of this change in the 19th century formed the basis upon which the academic discipline of English literature emerged in the 20th. And this is a familiar story. In this respect, as in many others, the Romantic period is the crucible for modern disciplinarity. Modern ideas of the sciences are also shaped in this period. Two main uh, challenges to the disciplinary security of English literature have emerged in, e in, re in recent years, however. Firstly, as we know too well, the mercantilist model of higher education has undermined the social and cultural authority of English and the humanities as a whole as academic disciplines. We're constantly having to justify the value of what we do in terms of how it equips the graduate for the 21st century economy, not mm. the humanist conception of citizens citizenship. Mm. Secondly, the digital revolution has challenged the traditional basis on which knowledge about literary texts was made and disseminated. It has led to increased awareness of the materiality of the text, hence the emergence of a romantic period book history, counting countering Romanticism's traditional emphasis on the immaterial, the ideal, and the transcendent. And it's also potentially decentered the book itself by complicating our ideas of what constitutes communication. One interesting and controversial response to the current situation has come from the Re-Enlightenment Project, led by Clifford Siskin and William B. Warner. Siskin is a romanticist, author of the work of writing, and Warner works on 18th century fiction and digital culture. Inaugurated in 2007, the Re-Enlightenment Project has taken the form of a series of gatherings, conference presentations, articles, and a collection of essays. This is Enlightenment, published in 2010. In 2008, Siskin and Warner co-authored an article in Profession entitled Stopping Cultural Studies, in which they review the various directions which English has taken in the last 30 years or so. These trends, which the authors characterise as invocations to theorise, to historicise and to go beyond the literary, are also those that have shaped Romanticism in this period. Siskin and Warner's argument is that doing cultural studies hasn't really changed anything. Cultural studies, they suggest, emerges out of and is bound up with the idea of culture with a capital C. Both senses of culture, um, the, uh, the division between small C culture and large C culture being a product of the Romantic period. For the literary scholar to go beyond uh, literature with a capital L into cultural studies is analogous to doing a bungee jump, they claim. It's a thrilling fall into the free play of small c culture, but because that idea of culture is conceptually tied to large c culture, the pullback to old-fashioned disciplinarity is always there. Doing cultural studies, they say, I quote, is like 
groundhog, doing Groundhog Day. You think you're getting somewhere different and then you always find you're back where you started. You never get to do what cultural studies is supposed to do, change literary studies. End of quote. Mm. Warner and Siskin's solution is to stop doing cultural studies in the sense of desisting from going beyond the literary, though I think stopping here also has connotations of resistance. However, this doesn't necessarily mean going back to literary study as it was before 1980. Stopping doing cultural studies means, in effect, stopping doing literature with a capital L. You avoid the bungee jump altogether and maybe go wine tasting in Otago instead. <laughs> Warner and Siskin claim that we need to, quote, break the spell of literature, with a capital L, by recovering the true sc scope of literature, small l, in its earliest comprehensive sense, culture remaining the ubiquitous term that still occludes our past and our future. In this and subsequent publications, the Re-Enlightenment Project has argued that there's an opportunity for English departments to reconfigure themselves as center, centers for the study of forms of mediation linking literary texts and other kinds of print media to electronic, digital and algorithmic forms of communication. I quote, Our relevance to universities and to society at large depends on a retooling that mixes some established means of mediation with new tools and that then deploys both across the newly altered and expanded range of literary activity. To extrapolate this to ANU in 2012, <coughs> English and ANU humanities in general could benefit from being more closely aligned with digital humanities and vice versa, not being struct structurally distinguished from it. The reception that the Re-Enlightenment project has received from Romanticists has been frosty to say the least. This is because what Siskin and Warner are arguing for, I think, um, effectively bypasses Romanticism and potentially weakens its status as the foundational movement for English literature as we know it today. Reconfiguring your discipline around the true scope of literature in its earliest comprehensive sense means going back to the period before the meaning of literature was refined and narrowed, that is, to the Enlightenment broadly conceived as extending from the Renaissance to the late 18th century. In an article published last year entitled, If This Is Enlightenment, Then What Is Romanticism? Siskin and Warner argued that Romanticism was not the radical break with the past that has been supposed, but an outcome of long-term changes in various forms of mediation. New ways of transporting and communicating texts, new genres such as the newspaper, new spaces and associational practices in which these texts were read, and finally, new rules, or what they call enabling constraints. <laughs> Enlightenment, they claimed, was, quote, an event of which Romanticism was an outcome or eventuality, and the Victorian a variation. The article includes stage directions for how Siskin and Warner enacted this distinction in the keynote le le lecture on which it is based. I quote, if this is enlightenment scaled to a hierarchy of change, open hands wide, then this is romanticism, not open hands as wide. End of quote. <laughs> it's not surprising that romanticists in the audience objected to both the diminution of the importance of their field of study and the pantomimic condescension by which this was communicated. It's not clear where exactly the Re-Enlightenment project is heading and what it might mean for Romanticism and literary studies more generally. I remain to be convinced that Siskin and Warner are as revolutionary as they claim to be and also wonder whether in this case, as before, Romanticism will absorb the challenge and carry on much as before. It seems that in making their gestures at the Nasser conference, Siskin and Warner wanted the romanticists present to rush into their arms, as it were, acknowledging the rightness of their cause and giving the future of romanticism over to them. The Re-Enlightenment project can therefore be seen 
as not so much a debunking of Romanticism's power, but an attempt to refashion that power in a different guise. It's still a Romantic project, and as such, it reinstantiates Romanticism's foundational significance for English literature. Whereas in the past, English departments were confident enough in their intellectual and institutional authority to generate satellite disciplines such as cultural studies, film studies and gender studies, in the current crisis in the humanities and as a result of the impact of digital technology, English, according to Siskin and Warner, needs to retool or redisciplinize itself. It can achieve this not by reabsorbing or remodeling itself in terms of the various studies that have emanated from it, but by becoming something different altogether, reimagining what the study of literature might mean for the future. Romanticism thus becomes emblematic of what needs to be left behind, but also a model of the change that might be. In that sense, romanticism can never be truly finished. Okay, well in this um, last part of the lecture, I want to turn briefly to another take on British Romanticism. Michael Winterbottom's TV series, The Trip, first broadcast in 2010. Winterbottom has a long history of engagement with the classics of Englit. He's directed three adaptations of Thomas Hardy novels, and also a wonderful film about trying to make a film of Lawrence Stern's Tristram Shandy, starring the British comedians Steve Coogan and Rob Brydon, who also appear in the trip. For those who haven't seen it, and unfortunately I can't really show anything of it, um, in the trip, Coogan plays a celebrity actor comedian called Steve Coogan, who's hired by the Observer newspaper to write reviews of expensive gourmet restaurants in the north of England. He invites his friend, the comedian Rob Brydon, played by Rob Brydon, to accompany him when his girlfriend dumps him. The drama consists of visits to these restaurants with conversations over lunch as the centrepiece. They often end up in competitive word games or impressions. Mm. Brydon's speciality being the voices of actors such as Roger Moore, Sean Connery and Al Pacino, and I'm going to start laughing because I'm thinking about the way it does it. <laughs> um, especially the Roger Moore, it completely cracks me up. <laughs> Romanticism is a recurring theme in the trip. Coogan and Bryden visit Greta Hall, the home of Southey and Wordsworth, and Dove Cottage, where the Wordsworths lived, and which is now the centre of the Wordsworth industry, both in a touristic and an academic sense. Bryden also recites lines from Tintern Abbey and Kubla Khan, to which uh, Coogan responds, I would have thought you would have preferred Olivia Newton-John's version of Xanadu. <laughs> <laughs> um, Coogan, in the trip, is the 21st century UK celebrity as romantic artist, a hacking scandal Byron, who's tortured about his failure to break into Hollywood stardom and troubled by his complicated family and love life. There are shots of him alone on top of a Lake District mountain like the brooding solitary figure in a Caspar David Friedrich painting, but rather than communing with his deep interiority or the sublime, he's instead trying to get a mobile phone signal. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting that Romanticism should surface in this way in 2010, post the great national events of the climate change and the GFC, when the consciousness of the historical moment and where we're heading is heightened. It's tempting to see the references to Wordsworth and Coleridge as signs of contemporary cultural decay, the travesting of romantic ideals of English culture and tradition based on the sublimity of nature. The transformation of old English inns into gourmet tourist destinations is emblematic of the commodification of brand UK as high-end luxury good and playground for the 1% super wealthy leaving the rest to pick up the tacky souvenirs in the Dove Cottage shop. But the trip's idea of romanticism is not limited to Wordsworth and Coleridge or the solitary artist on the mountaintop. It also evokes romantic culture as a mode of sociability and the importance of talk within it by referring to another important romantic writer, William Hazlitt. At one stage, 
Bryden quotes from Hazlitt's devastating essay on Coleridge in the spirit of the age. Quote, it was not supposed that Mr. Coleridge could keep on at the rate he set off. He could not realize all he knew or thought, and thus could not fix his desultory ambition. Other stimulants supplied the place and kept up the intoxicating dream, the fever and the madness of his early impressions. Hazlitt's essay, like his My First Acquaintance uh, of Poets, reflects the importance of romantic genres such as the familiar essay in defining both the momentousness of cultural change embodied by figures such as Coleridge and the difficulty those figures had in living up to their roles. How, in a Gingrich sense, sense dreaming could yoke the sublime and the ridiculous. Hazlitt's presence in the trip is a reminder of Marilyn Butler's emphasis on a romanticism of citizens rather than solitaries. A romanticism that was also prosaic, sociable, and, and sometimes playfully subversive. Another important romantic writer, Charles Lamb, being an adept in punning, as indeed was Keats. No one could do impressions of romanticisms, romanticism better than the romanticists themselves. They were their own impersonators. Finally, another important lesson of the trip relates to gender. British Romanticism may well best be seen as a bloke thing, which achieved its most powerful expression not only in the great works of literature which have survived from it, but also in the male homosocial modes of talk, companionship and competitive banter which the trip celebrates. From Wordsworth and Coleridge to Siskin and Warner, Romanticism has thrived on its male double acts. One reason perhaps why, in spite of the recent attention given to women's writing, some of us feel that we're still in the audience and not part of the show. In this latter respect, to echo Marilyn Butler's claim that Romanticism is incohate, we might ask, not is Romanticism finished, but has it yet properly begun? I'll finish that. various twists and turns it's, it's taken with imagery studies in the last uh, 30 years. Um, extraordinary overview, but, um, but also a, a powerful vision yourself of what romanticism might still become. Like you, I was, uh, having seen the trip, I was also borderline starting to, to chuck, fondly chuckle at various impressions. I had to kind of get back to, uh, to things once I started thinking about, you know, some of those uh, conversations I have at, uh, at various restaurants. But we've got a good, um, we've got a good half hour for... Um, Questions? Does anyone uh, wanna, does anyone wanna start us off? So, you, no? Right, yes. Yeah. Um, this is a bit unusual. So I, I'm um, doing theology studies at the moment, but mm -hmm. I've done postgraduate in other areas, yeah. um, and I'm looking at embarking next year on a um, thesis on the um, religious and biblical imagery in Blake. Mm -hmm. Because <clears throat> my um, observation has been that um, the religious, um, the spiritual, perhaps yeah. in some sense, it's, has been long sidelined mm -hmm. um, in um, certainly what, what I've come across in English literature yeah. and in uh, the humanities. Mm -hmm. um, so I wondered, um, and I've wondered at times about some of the romantic authors, I mean, I think... I, Maybe it's my ignorance, but I think of George Eliot as a yep. as, as a romantic mm -hmm. um, writer too. But yep. there's an assumption, perhaps from a, a standpoint of a strident atheist secular humanist position, mm -hmm. that um, the the romantics had really nothing to do with religion, but more than that, had no faith, or that the spiritual dimension of life was not important to them. Mm -hmm. But um, Generation X and Ys would today challenge that some, some of that mm -hmm. thinking because they, they will regard themselves, you know, we will, yeah. can say that we're spiritual but not necessarily religious. 
In other words, there's a distinction between the institution of religion and how that those institutions behave and conduct themselves and um, that other dimension of life that some people call romantic, uh, spiritual. So I wonder, yes, whether there's, whether there's new... I mean, in, in terms of theology, there are things happening. There's reception theory. There's, uh, there's been a book, for example, written, just published just this past year on Blake and the Bible, which is not, you know, I hasten to add from a fundamentalist, um, this is much more, this is a Christianity yeah. or whatever, theology that's engaged very much with yeah. cultures that's influenced by feminism as well. Yeah. So, yeah, in all of that, is there something that... Well, yeah, <coughs> I you might have gathered from my accent, I'm, I'm not Australian born, I'm from Northern Ireland. Yeah. So, um, I'm partly because of my upbringing there, I, I tend to avoid religion. Yes, yes, sure, um, sure. And, um, I I'm, I'm incredibly secular. Yes, yes. Um, so, but, but, I mean, religion is a very, very powerful strand within romanticism, both in terms of, like, in a sense, and Blake is obviously, a, you know, a very interesting example of, but also the way in which you know, Blake's religion also, uh, you know, is very much part of his politics and vice yeah. versa. Yeah. So, you know, in, in a sense, like, you know, there is, a, there has been a tendency to split, like, uh, you know, the, the religion, you know, from, um, you know, the study of kind of literature in that sense. But, yeah. um, you know, it's, it's very, it is very important. And, and in a way, yeah, I suppose that whole idea of romantic, romanticism being, a religion in a way, mm -hmm. um, the romantic mm -hmm. idea and, it, and, it's, and it's spiritualism. But again, that's something that um, I suppose what I what I was kind of indicating in the paper is like, in a sense, my own orientation towards um, and 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 in a sense, um, suspicion of the big picture claims and um, with, um, and, and the way these kind of larger meanings are articulated so yeah, yeah. But, but you know but there's there's just a, I, w I wouldn't suggest that romantic studies in the last few years has ignored the topic of religion it is very engaged with it okay. but but, but I, I, and also like people like Joanna Southcott who um, in 1814 who um, claimed she was going to give birth to Kids smiling. <laughs> She's going to give birth to the Messiah. Um, uh, there were their religious culture at that time is really significant and powerful and an important strand in Romanticism. Mm. Mm. But again, how we conceive and determine Romanticism is is, is partly the issue as well. Yeah. I suppose I'm also thinking that because uh, in the Australian universities, you know, theology has not been a part. Yep. Um, and I, I'm, I'm not downgrading the secular humanism, but um, what I'm saying is that the, in, um, well, ACU, for example, uh, um, yep. theology department, but elsewhere too, yep. where it is starting to become, there are, um, there are studies, with, uh, cultural studies are yep. a, a, an aspect, even if they're yep. not called that, yep. and that there's actually new opportunities for engagement, yep. Yeah, yep. if there's a willingness to do it. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Actually, I can see two people. We've got plenty of time, so um, it's yeah. Uh, just, I mean, I, I'm an old-fashioned guy, and I mm. immediately thought of M. H. Abrams' book, yep. uh, Natural Supernaturalism, yep. which connects yep. romanticism yep. directly to yep. um, religious traditions and to Christianity. Yeah. yeah. Um, oh, right. But um, and I think, thank you for what you were saying. Mm -hmm. Your story about the trip reminded me of the time when I was overlooking the Isle of Skye near Applebury, yeah. and all these people there, yeah. uh, and the, the bricks were all smoking their fags, watching, looking yeah. at the view. The uh, Germans had all cycled up the mountain and were eating yeah. muesli bars. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the Americans were, were in a caravan looking away from the view, trying to adjust the antenna on the television yeah. set. So, yeah. so what you were saying there about that is... Uh, my question is a, is a very general one, and it's really just to do with the question of irony in relation to, yeah. to romanticism. But um, mm -hmm. I, I see a kind of... A, there's a tension I haven't sorted out between yeah. people like Hegel, for example, mm -hmm. who are very hostile to irony and you know, talk about yeah. it as the destruction of authenticity, the impossibility yeah. of art uh, yep. in the Irony, and then those other writers 
to identify romanticism, like Schmidt, for example, to identify yeah. romanticism with irony as, as yeah. fundamentally an, an ironic um, positioning in, in relationship to the self. So, so mm. where do you see irony being positioned uh, within that sort of spectrum of possibilities? Um, it's it's, yeah, I, it's actually, to tell you the truth, it's something I'm not that interested in. <laughs> <laughs> I've never been, in, that, that's where, you know, the whole question of the complexity of romanticism comes into play. I've never been that interested in that, in philosophical romanticism mm -hmm. in that sense. Mm. I'm much, you know, and, but I'm, in a way, I'm, and that's why, in a sense, I stand outside. Rema I, I, in terms of my red waistcoat, I'm not wearing <laughs> my red waistcoat, but I don't actually have one. Mm -hmm. So um, I would have to say to you that my, you know, I'd, I'd need to think about that more and to engage with the discourse that you're introducing mm -hmm. into this conversation. Um, and um, yeah, and, and saying that, like, yeah, I, I mean, I, I see it as, yeah, does that, does that make sense? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's Monique and then, yeah. Monique? Um, yeah, my question is about your argument about the foundational nature of romanticism um, mm -hmm. and also your response to the, the Chandler essay about concerns yep. about the future and yep. um, it, the argument that, well, romanticism was, um, you know, about decommemorisation, instability. Yeah. Um, and so that we're seeing a resurgence of that and mm -hmm. I, I guess you were linking that to digital culture. Um, but isn't, um, is, is part of Chandler's argument about the representative nature of the romantic? Um, and I'm, I'm just wondering if that's something that can't be replicated in the present digital, you know, so the whole... Yep. Um, yep. The whole possibility of having a big six, for example, yep. in the digital yep. age. Um, yeah. I know that's a, a big question. I yeah. If you had any. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I. I think that also um, relates to the the Siskin and Warner um, agenda as well, uh -huh. in a sense like. Um, like what what are the implications for and, and this is why it in a sense is problematic for for um you know for larger literature in, in, yeah. in that sense and why but but in a sense why um why they want you know romanticism in a sense to embrace this um so i mean i'm trying to argue that in, in a sense like it is profoundly romantic in its kind of conception of I think underlying it, the idea of the possibility of making change, of, of making the future in that sense. Mm. Um, so it's more to do with something that is generative and performative. Um, and in that way, that, that will link, so what I'm trying to suggest is that that relates also to certain kind of protocols and styles within uh, within the profession itself, you know, in a sense, that's also where I, I'm, I'm really interested in, in, in that, the theatricality of romanticism that was happening at the time. It's there, you know, but it's also continued to be, it's still part of the culture of romanticism as a subfield of the profession. So, so it's not so much. But that's never been particularly emphasised. There's really not, yeah, there was, yeah, it, it, it is, isn't something I think that has is, is really been um, significantly um, explored. But, yeah, um, well, I'm just trying to my, yeah. I think we had Kath Bowden, yeah. Thanks for a really great paper. Um, I was really interested in what you were talking about in terms of remediation and big yep. culture, big C, little C. Yep. And the bungee jump? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was actually the bungee jump I wanted to raise. Yes. What um, strikes me about digital humanities is that it 
Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. doing that challenge and it slaps right back into yeah. almost the big six. I mean, you yeah. think about what the, the big digital projects were they yeah. through the ideas of having a yeah. video and that's where yeah. they end up. Yeah. Both book history and bibliography, and these things strike me as something um, different um, to that for, form of mediation in that bibliography, for instance, is supposed to be indiscriminate. I mean, you know, yeah. not always end up. So I guess in terms of the questions you're putting out there about the future and the past yeah. of the discipline, if if you could comment a bit more about what you mean by remediation, how that process of remediation and and what does Jerome McGann call it? You know, yeah, that's what he says, right? Remediating our entire cultural heritage. Yeah. How that fits in with where the studies might go. Sorry, very broad question. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um. Again, in, in terms of the Siskin and, and Warner agenda, as it's kind of outlined, particularly in that um, this is an Enlightenment book, do you know that? No, yeah, yeah it's, yeah. Um, it, which came out in 2010. It looks to me very much about, like, it's like cultural studies. I, 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 it it's doesn't seem to be that, you know, dissimilar from it, but I think their focus is, like, primarily on um, on, on, on texts and, and you know, in a sense how textuality works in kind of various, various dimensions of that. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, I mean it, it really, I think we're at a very crucial juncture about in terms of the way all our disciplines are going. Um, but one of the things that we really need to think about is what of what disciplinarity means in that sense, and whether, in a way, um, it, you know, the, the point I'm really making about Siskin and Warner that I think what they're trying to do is kind of, you know, reconstitute English literature as a discipline. Um, it's not just, you know, coming from a position, we know what we are and we can let culture studies and film studies and all that and digital humanities develop. But what I would say would be problematic is that digital humanities becomes another discipline, in a sense, that it, it, that it starts kind of, you know, defining itself um, in, in disciplinary terms. Um, rather than actually thinking about well what um, what are the what's the effect of those structures of disciplinarity that we're creating which then also relate to the broader our working and teaching and thinking environments that we experience institutionally the, the so-called real world so we it's it's very very complex but it, it seems to be that um, um, at least I think what's interesting about the Siskin and Warner position is they're actually challenging, they're going out there, they're performing it, um, and they're, they're trying to uh, get us to think about, like, where do we want, you know, that uh, our future to lie. Does that, I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm just concerned that, you know, you know, we have departments of digital humanities. Mm. Um, yeah, no, uh, and no, and I, you know, it, so it becomes bound mm. up with that, with basically the whole, the history of the university as it's developed in the last, you know, since the post-war period. Mm. So rather than actually, so like, we, what, what way can we teach? What different way can we teach? What different texts can we, can we, as, as I suppose I want to get beyond the, the, the conversation that's always about defining what you want, your, your turf. Mm. You know? no, no, and that's what I was trying to yeah. say by digital managers. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't think that's a good yeah. thing. Yeah. So. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I saw Andrew. Mm -hmm. Yes, no, oh, Jane, I was just wondering uh, could you talk a bit about the theatricality of romanticism mm. as you enjoy it? Simply mm. that. <laughs> oh. Not about um, studying the theatre of the Georgian period, but the yes. theatricality of romanticism. Mm -hmm. As you enjoyed. As I enjoyed. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I was trying to give a flavour of that, you know, in a way, in the sense of, um, and even in relation to, you know, my next question about, you know, the, the Chandler 
essay. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's in, in a sense not so much what he's saying. It's the fact he's saying it now, and that sense of like here here you know I can say what's going to happen in a hundred years time, and it's the grandeur of that mm. you know as a as an intellectual project, mm. and I find that like and that's in a sense very attractive about romanticism, mm. but then and then this maybe is where the irony comes in as well is that sense of like the um you know you get you get brought in you get you know pulled into it in that sense. Um, and you start, you start believing in it, <laughs> and it's the, and it's that, and that's why someone like someone like Hazlitt is just so fascinating because he's there, like he's walking along with Coleridge, you know, trying to kind of track the way Coleridge writes. He completely shows us the moment of the specificity of these guys, like changing the world. He was there, he documents it, he, um, but at the same time, he's kind of like um, showing us how, uh, he's, he's despairing about it as well, like that sense of like, uh, it's both the grandeur and the failure that seem to come together. But I just wonder also, to, and I, you know, that that is also gendered in a sense for romanticism, because I can't think of, like um, certainly in terms of women writers at the time, mm. but also like um, also scholars that maybe you know like I've referred to Marilyn Butler a few times, but um, you know she's a kind of exception as someone who kind of um, worked around. She didn't work on the really big six figures like her first major study was on the novelist Mariah Edgeworth. She worked on Thomas Love Peacock. And, you know, going back to Romantics, Rebels and Reactionaries was just, uh, I find, really enjoyable, you know, to go back to the... And what she, she's she got this big panoramic kind of view of... Um, so in that sense, she's saying, I'm going to show it to you, but I'm not going to be it. I don't have to be it. And that, that's where I would say that there's a distinction between, um, you know, that maybe a, a gender distinction between how, you know, male scholars, prominent male scholars are engaged in romanticism and how, you know, mm. um, particular women have explored mm. it. Does that? Yeah. Mm. I know that, um, yeah, the, the uh, question of the, the approach on religion uh, is very difficult. Uh, socially and culturally and the, and the moments yeah. and the structures and the political structures, etc., from which this romantics come from and, and change. Yeah. But surely there is an element of the, myst the mystical mysticism mm. Yeah. Mm. that, mm. that uh, is, is quite profound in romanticism. Mm. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 No, I don't, I don't describe that. I'm just, in a sense, what, what I think is the... the the dimension of romanticism which is, relates to the complexity of a social world enacting itself mm. and it's every an everydayness you know like that's what I actually you know but which I think hasn't really figured too significantly within Scotch. romanticism and uh, you know that and it's that that sociable world um, that I think I think is well, I certainly am more attracted to, yes. and you know, and I do think it does actually. It's it's part of like my background. <laughs> yeah, sure. yeah. So can I can I just throw in after that comment? Um, yeah, um, and, and question about um, you know, according to mysticism, and and uh, um, oh, sorry, I might have forgotten what I was going to say. Sorry. Oh. <laughs> sorry. Um, oh, sorry, Tom, you're obscured by the camera. But we'll, we'll have. Um, no, we've got enough time. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Gillian. That was um, an astonishing tour de force. Uh, oh, I think if, if, I, if you wanted to give an alternative title, 
Yeah. You could call it something like breaking up with romanticism is hard. Sorry? To do. If you want to give an alternative title, you could call it breaking up with romanticism is yeah. hard to do. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it yeah. seems to me that yeah, uh, in yeah. the narrative, there's nothing more romantic than trying to get out of romanticism. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Which is, which is kind of particularly relevant to the, to, to the position you're adopting with yeah. regard to romanticism yourself, which is yeah. something of something you want to resist, something you want yeah. to yeah. fight outside of. Um, so, one usable definition of romantic irony is when you yeah. is the moment when you realise the story you're telling is about yourself, that you're a character. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, and yeah. and I kind of like to. So irony is relevant. Yeah, this, yeah, uh, definitely. Yep. To this, to this um, <laughs> topic, um, I, I I just want to I, I want to try and um, get a, a, a slightly more concrete sense. Of the of the romanticism to come that you that you kind of mentioned at the mm -hmm. very end of the piece yeah. of, of a romanticism that hasn't yet begun. Uh, so, well, so so the, the kind of the kind of self transcending moment that mm -hmm. you try and leap out of romanticism and, and by doing so you only reconfirm the romantic ideology. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, this is this is it's a dynamic that's actually that, that's kind of theorised and built into the yeah. the literary production of the time. Yeah. So it's, yeah. it's that kind of dynamic that Shelley's pointing to in the defense of yeah. poetry, where he says yeah. this is the way that poetry keeps language alive. Yeah. This is the way yeah. this is how poetry keeps language alive by 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 leaving beyond what what is poetically possible. Yeah. And that's how you make new poetry. Yeah. And, so, see, and you also mentioned uh, that this is a period, uh, and, and you know, to, to, you're absolutely right. Mm. This is a period of the kind of the crucible of disciplinarity. Yeah. It's yeah. the moment of the emergence yeah. of the research university. Yeah. And someone like. Uh, like Humboldt in his yeah. famous memo on the Berlin University, where he's sort of theorizing the possibility of the research university that doesn't exist, yeah. Yeah. spells out the same kind of logic as the inherent dynamic of disciplinarity. And he says yeah. the research university, in fact, rather than poetry, that is yeah. what keeps language alive. Specifically, yeah. he's using this kind of same vitalist language about language as, as Shelley yeah. was doing. So you've got poetry on the one hand and the yeah. university on the other, but at both Areas of social life that have this kind of self-transcending, yeah. paradoxical relationship where you try, you, 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 you reconfirm the practice you're dissipating yeah. in by trying to exceed it. Yeah. You flagged a third type of romanticism, a kind of prosaic, modern yeah. romanticism, yeah. a romanticism of sort of table talk. Yeah. And 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 and, and sociability. Yeah. That's in your discourse quote. So somewhat oppositional to the, yeah. the, the romantic poetry and poetics. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is it also oppositional then necessarily to the university? I mean, is, is, can there be a disciplinarity of table talk? Yeah. That's, so my, I guess my question is, yeah. 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 if there's a romanticism to come, will it, will it be the kind of Michael Winterbottom, the trip yeah. type of, will that be a social location? Or yeah. can it take up a home in the academy? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Can I hire you too? <laughs> um, yeah, that's really, really interesting. Um, um, just, I, I'm not going to answer it directly immediately, but just, I, I was aware, like, in concluding that, the, the paper, that I was kind of engaging in, in a romantic gesture that I felt uncomfortable about, to tell you the truth. And I, you know, that, oh, you know, but what would be more romantic? But yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. It's that, that, that. Yeah. So, so, um, but yeah, but that yeah that that sense. Well, well maybe that that third kind of um, you know sociable romanticism uh, that maybe that's why we need to go back to this period in a sense to kind of explore what what were the dimensions you know because they didn't have the research university then either so in a sense it would suggest the kind of necessity to um, actually explore what what that kind of sociable romanticism kind of meant and that's kind of happening to some extent um, and but I mean, one one thing, you know, and I have been thinking about because of our uh, kind of current situation as well, is in a sense, you know, what is the place of the literary 
um, and the extent to which you know that conversation um, and you know my I was talking about this project I mean, this paper with my partner and, and he was saying well people people talk about you know the whole significance of book clubs and um, and uh, you know and writers festivals and so on is because they do things that universities don't do anymore. Mm 